friends, Heidi here from Rain Country. God is good all the time. And I'm here for another Monday This and That vlog. And for those of you who are new, these kind of videos, I talk about all kinds of different topics. A lot of times it's for the purpose of giving you quick updates, announcements, such as uh, the Encyclopedia of Country Living book winners, and so much more. Since I'm currently about four weeks ahead on my videos, I like to have at least one video that comes out every week that's a little more close to the time that it was shot, so we keep everybody on track. Now, let's get to the topics of today, starting with the toxic squash. Ooh, scary, scary. So, <laughs> last week's video, you might have seen me showing this zucchini or pump zini or zoo pumpkin or whatever you want to call it. And it is a cross between zucchini and pumpkin. And if you watched my video last week, you would have noticed it's far more green than it looks right now. Eventually, it'll be completely orange, just like this pie pumpkin right here. Well, in that, after showing that video, I had a few people come in and say, aren't you scared to eat it? I heard that a pumpkin and zucchini cross is toxic and you shouldn't eat it. Well, I'd never actually heard of that before, but I did do some research. I'll cover that in just a minute, but I'll just let you know that we've been eating on these for a couple of years now. In fact, liked it so much when I got it last year that I saved the seeds from that one intentionally grew it again this year because it has a better flavor than a regular zucchini but when you when you're using it while it's green but then it can still be once you let it go completely orange like you'll see in this picture here from one last year you can still use it up like you would a pumpkin or any other kind of squash my purpose for this one is to save the seeds from this one as well and then use the meat the flesh from it like I would with a acorn squash or butternut squash or anything like that, where I'm just gonna mash it and have it with a little butter and salt as a side dish. Here's what I found. There is a substance in your squash, cucumbers, your pumpkins, your zucchini, called cucurbitacin. I think I'm saying it right. Here's the spelling right here so you can see what it looks like. Now, in high quantities, that can be toxic, but here's the key you'll know if there's too much in it. You'll know because it makes it very, very bitter. So here's another example that I didn't talk about uh, in last week's video is I had that happen with some of my cucumbers this last year. And even though all these things are growing in completely different spots, it's still, I still got cross pollination with the pumpkins and the cucumbers and the pumpkins and the zucchini. And so what happened was some of my cucumbers, especially the ones that came later, the very last ones that were coming in the season, they started turning orange. I've never had my cucumbers turn orange before. And these were just your standard straight A cucumbers, which they typically have a bitter peel, but the rest of the cucumbers fine, so I typically peel them. But the ones that started turning orange, those ones were bitter through and through. And you didn't want to eat them. They were nasty. I tried, but they were gross. So they got they got composted. That should be a pretty good indicator. I wouldn't, so don't worry yourself sick about, oh, I can't eat it because it's, you know, it's gonna be toxic since it's clearly a cross. All you have to do is taste it. If it tastes bitter, spit it out and then throw out the rest, compost it. Uh, that's It's that simple. So it just kind of goes back to this whole thing where it just seems like there's always people out there trying to make people afraid of their food, whether it be how they preserve it or what they're growing in their garden. But a lot of times it's just common sense. For it to be toxic, it would have to be pretty bitter and there's no way you're gonna wanna eat that unless you're some weird crazy person that enjoys that flavor. But, and maybe there are, maybe you're not weird and crazy. Maybe you like things that bitter, but if it's bitter, spit it out, that simple. Now for the winners of the book giveaway contest. So that was from uh, a couple of Wednesdays ago, we I put out the video and then I gave people a week to get in their, all their comments. That's how they entered the contest. I put a post on YouTube and I made a short, but not all the people, at least at the time I'm shooting this video, have seen it yet to reply. I've only had one person out of the five winners get back to me through email, rankcountryhomestead at gmail.com with their address so that the company can ship the book directly to them. So I'll read these winners again, and that is Sarah Barentine, Janae F. Her full name on YouTube is Melissa Gian Foster. 
Authentic Homestead. They were the first ones to get back to me. Susan, Kenny, and Holly Keck. So these are the five winners of the book that won in the drawing. And how that works is there are programs that you can use for free online where you can go to your YouTube, you put your YouTube link in there, the video link, and then it just pulls them up. And I just did one at a time like that so I could take a, a screenshot of each of the winners so that I had proof that I did it that way and that I used that. And uh, yeah, so then once I have those addresses, I'll send them off to the company and they will ship you out the copy of that book. So congratulations to the five winners. There were like 450 comments altogether at the time I was doing the drawing, and there's even more under there now. So out of the 450 people that commented, only five winners, but thank you for everyone who tried, and thank you to Sasquatch Books for being so generous to do this for my subscribers. Really appreciate it, and they do too. So moving on from there, I wasn't going to talk about this right off the bat, but I'm going to go ahead and say it because... A couple of weeks ago, I was talking about the Nakano knives, and I think I mentioned a 20% off, and I thought it had started then, and I'm sorry for those if I misled you, it was totally unintentional. The 20% off sale on the Nakano knives is going on now, and the reason I'm pointing out these flowers is because I just got these in. It was a surprise gift from Nakano knives. They really like me, and I appreciate that. They've really been of all my affiliates, um, them and Mother Earth products have been the two that have spoiled me the most, and I really appreciate that. And they also sent me this cute little plaque, which I'm definitely going to be hanging up somewhere. So, total surprise, just like the book they sent me on Japanese cooking. That was also a total surprise, and you can tell it was an expensive book. And they're going to be sending me out another knife called the micarta which is the one i think is the most beautiful as far as the blade goes so i'm really excited to try that so i'll be doing an update as soon as i get that but anyway um i do have a video review on the nakano knives they are japanese made knife they are going to be more expensive than just your standard knives you're going to buy in the store and honestly I, I like to say this because i don't want to try to push expensive products on people who don't need them or can't afford them i made it for 57 years using just whatever sharp knife I could find and some of my favorite ones I found at garage sales. And that was the Pioneer Woman. I loved those. Those were at least a few of those out of that out of those that particular set that I bought. I used them all the time and they were my favorite knives up until I got the olive wood handle Nakano knives and they were gifted to me. I did buy the set of three paring knives because I like their knives so much and I use paring knives quite a bit. So I bought a set of three and I'm so glad I did this. I use these a lot. Absolutely love them. And by the way, I use my own 15% discount to get those too. So that was kind of cool. I actually got to save a little bit of money on that. But anyway, um, I'll be putting that link down below. In fact, it's always in my description box, but currently it is 20% off, I think, until the end of November. So I'll try to mention it a couple more times just to remind you. For those people who are interested, but please, please never feel pushed or forced into getting something you cannot afford. If you're making do with what you got, then make do with what you got. A good sharp knife is definitely nice when you're cooking, but it's not going to affect the taste of your food. As long as you can cut up your food, even if you have to use a butter knife, Use what you can. So anyway, I just wanted to share that. I love my Nakano knives, and I appreciate how generous they've been with me and the great affiliate that I've had with them. And But again, don't make yourself go broke if you don't need a set of knives like that. Don't do it. Anyway, so moving on from there, let's talk a little bit about some some dried stuff again. I mean, to do as you guys know, if you've been following me at all, even within the past year, you'll know I've been doing really ramping up my dehydrating. In fact, did far more dehydrating this year than I did canning because I need to save space. So one of the things is the squash that I did. This is actually spaghetti squash. I dehydrated up and powdered a couple of years ago. And the interesting thing about that is when I, obviously it's not gonna keep that same texture, so you can't really use it as a spaghetti replacement. But by dehydrating it, powder, powdering it, not only did it save space, but it added a really sweet, unexpectedly sweet flavor to the spaghetti squash. And I keep forgetting I have it. So I pulled this jar out the other day and took, you can see how much I took out and cooked it up for dinner. And it made quite a bit. And I just added some butter and salt to it. So good. I absolutely love it. So 
yes, you can do the same thing with your spaghetti squash, your butternut squash, your acorn squash, whatever squash you're growing, your pumpkin. It's the only way I preserve the pumpkin now. I leave my pumpkins out, um, and you know, I've got several in the other room. I, I leave them out until the end of November, and usually early December is when I start putting them up. I bake them, dehydrate them. I have a video just on that I'll link to down below. And then they get used for so many things. Lately, I've been adding the pumpkin powder to my coffee in the morning with a pinch of my mixed spice blend. Uh, once in a great while, I might add some half and half and no sweetener. I actually like it just like that. It's so good. But um, some other things I wanted to mention. Now, this isn't something I dried up. This is uh, some cherries, some organic freeze-dried cherries I get from Mother Earth products. One of the things that made me decide whether or not I wanted a invest in a freeze dryer was trying out a bunch of freeze dried foods and I've done that through Mother Earth products and decided there's there's just not enough freeze dried products that make it worth me investing that's one of the reasons in a freeze dryer but for those things that I've only recently started growing like cherries we only just got cherries this year or I can't grow at all like mangoes, pineapples, and more, I'd still have to go buy those things and dry them and freeze dry them myself. And that is, to me, just isn't worth that expense. If that's the only thing I really like freeze dried, but I wanna bring that up is because Mother Earth Products has been my go-to place. So I stock up on things like mangoes, pineapples, bananas, sour cherries. I've even got some raspberries because we've been raspberry shy in our garden for a few years now, but hopefully within this next year, we'll start getting more raspberries again. So having these on hand as a backup plan is just really great. And you can use freeze dried goods easily for powdering. So if you already have a freeze dryer, then consider all your different fruits and the things that you can do with them once you have them freeze dried. Because one thing about, I will say, I do like about freeze drying when it comes to fruits is that anything that's high sugar, your the freeze drying is going to make it so that you can easily powder it. So that is nice about the freeze drying is that if you want to use it as a flavoring, but don't want the whole chunks in there, powdering is really nice. So what I did, um, you know, and I always vacuum seal them, by the way, whenever it's freeze dried, especially, you always want to vacuum seal if you only take a little bit out, reseal it, or everything in here is going to go stale. And um, it's not that it's not edible, it's just going to go stale. It's going to, it's not going to have that nice crispiness. But anyway, what I did was I made, uh, last time we went out to our friends, uh, I made a an apple crisp. And with all the apple pies with the cinnamon and all that that I've been making, I decided I wanted a different flavor. So what I did was I put, I powdered up some of these cherries, added some orange juice and a little bit of my homemade vanilla extract just for a completely different flavor. And it was really, really good. And so you can do that with anything raspberries, pineapples, mangoes, whatever your favorite fruit is. If you've got a lot of apples or something like that coming in, you want to just do something different, make a different flavored pie, just powder up some of your freeze-dried goods and throw them in there if you have them. But anyway, Mother Earth Products, my go-to place, I always have a link to them in the description box. They're really great people to deal with, family-owned right here in the United States, and I love that they've been carrying far more organic products. So even though I'm doing good on carrots now, finally we're getting good carrots, I have bought a lot of dehydrated carrots from them. And now, especially now that they have the organic. So I there's a there are still things I do like to stock up on while I can, because if I can't get bananas, mangoes, and pineapple from the store at some point, then I like, I certainly can't grow those things. Those things just do not grow here. So I like having those on him. Now, continuing on with the dried goods. So I recently just did, I've got three different jars here of dried meats. I didn't label these, but by the looks of them, I know what they are. This here is dehydrated corn beef. And this is dried elk burger. And this is dried hamburger. Now, one thing about the hamburger, this was one I just wanted to fill up my, um, dehydrator because I had the meats going on there and I still had a free tray. So I took out a jar of my canned beef burger and then that I canned myself and then decided to throw that on there and dry it out. Where usually when I do ground meats, like I did this uh, elk burger, I just take the ground meat, I brown it, I put it on the trays and dehydrated. This is the one meat that you can do. You don't have to do the whole freezing and then dehydrating thing. 
and it still works great in most of the things you're going to use it for. But the if it's pre-canned or cooked, frozen, and then and then dehydrated, it's going to give it a lighter, crispier texture that's actually going to rehydrate much better and be more like freeze-dried meats. In fact, very, very similar to freeze-dried meats. And so I've been so happy with this process. So as long as it's either been pressure cooked or canned or cooked, frozen, and then dehydrated, you'll get that texture. So I, I have a video coming out um, in a few weeks about that very thing where I talk about all about how to do that. And I've done this now with chicken, turkey, and more. And beef roast, the beef roast was great. In fact, here's a clip of it after I rehydrated it. And it was, I, I, it might not be the best clip, but I just soaked it for a little bit in just room temperature water just to try it out. And it actually rehydrated as if it, I had just cooked it and not dried it at all. So that means it's really great for throw, using for anything. So even if you're, you don't want to use it in a soup or a sauce where you already got liquid to cook it in, if you've got, let's say, something where you're going to maybe do a stir fry and you're going to throw the meat right in there and you're not, you don't, you don't have a liquid that it go, it's going to absorb, simply soak it. And it doesn't even have to be in just plain water. You can soak it in whatever you want to give it flavor. It can be your homemade wine with, with some seasonings added to it. It can be broth, whatever you want to soak it in. So right here, I decided um, I had a couple of corned beef. So I'm still trying to clean that freezer out and make a lot more room in there for the turkey I've got coming in from, from butcher box and some other meats and the quarter of beef that we're still waiting to come. It's going to arrive any time. So I've been really making some space in there. So I took the two remaining corned beefs I had in there, cooked them both up, ate on one for a couple of nights, and the other one I cut it up right away, froze it, and then dehydrated it. And oh man, this is good. And I I'm vacuum sealed it up as soon as I could because otherwise I'd keep snacking on it. And what I really want to use this for is the next time I make coal cannon out of my dried potatoes and more, I'm just going to throw everything into the pot, add the water because I've got the dried cabbage too. So I'm going to do that. Everything going into the coal cannon, the next batch I make is going to be all completely dehydrated. So the corned beef, the which is just an added bonus. A coal can is not always made with meat. But and then the potatoes and the cabbage and then whatever seasonings that spices I'm gonna add. So anyway, uh yeah, just a really great method and um really happy with this and you know that I discovered simply by accident because I put some you know, turkey from a Thanksgiving into the freezer. Obviously it was cooked. And then I decided, hey, I'm gonna go ahead and pull this out and dehydrate it to make space. And when I tried it, I couldn't believe how crispy it was. So I've been trying that with so many things and then using it and love it. So what I've got going on right here, in fact, is I pulled out just a whole bunch of chicken breasts that I'd stocked up on from Butcher Box out of my freezer. And so I've got them marinating right now in some I've got coconut aminos in there. I got Bragg's liquid aminos. And yes, I know about the recent change in Bragg's, so I won't be buying them anymore. But And then some homemade wine and some garlic and onion. And what I'm going to be doing is grilling all these up tonight. And some of it obviously will eat on for dinner. And then the rest, I'm going to put, I'm going to cut it up, put it in the freezer, and then dehydrate that up. So you want your stuff to, you want the meat to, to freeze overnight after it's been cooked. That's the key. Cooked frozen, then dehydrated, or pressure cooked or canned, and then dehydrated. Either one of those methods will work. But anyway, with that, I'm going to finally be trying out this new cast iron grilling type pan that I got for my wood stove. So this is specifically for my wood stove. And I decided I would go ahead and splurge because last year, what happens around here if you want to do a barbecue, because our winters are just so wet, it's either going to be freezing out there, or it's going to be you're gonna get drenched trying to barbecue outside. So last year I started, I have, we always, we have all these grills. So I started just grilling the meat directly on the wood stove by just laying a grill that would go in a barbecuer. So we have a bunch of these that we picked up from the dump and cleaned them up and I use them for many different things. Decided to try it, set it right on the wood stove and grilled the meat. It was great. However, 
it's messy. Obviously, it gets all over the wood stove. Then I got to clean the grill. And I thought something like this would be a lot nicer because it would keep everything contained and it's not running all over the wood stove. So I'm really anxious to try that up with the chicken tonight. And that's it for my this and that for the week. So I hope you enjoyed this video. And don't forget to check out any video links and anything else I plan on putting in the description box down below by clicking on more or show more, whatever channel you're watching from or device you're watching from it may look a little bit different but it's right down here somewhere below the video screen you click on that it opens the description box so you can find all my contact information the affiliate links the video links and anything else i need to put in there and thanks for watching take care and god bless